called uh, entitled Essays on the Architectonic Body. So uh, <clears throat> the fifth actually should have been uh, the lecture by uh, Philippe Morel, but which is uh, had to be unfortunately postponed on the 18th of March, always at 6.30 p.m. Uh, today instead, uh, we have, um, sorry, just a second. We have um, Vera Bullman with the lecture on bodies of thinking and the fascist affect. Uh, but before introducing uh, our guest, which is also, let's say, a host tonight, um, let me just spend a few words about the School of Materialist Research. So the School of Materialist Research, SMR, is an education and research collective that offers intensive study courses, seminars, special programs, and research initiatives that address the, the materials running through contemporary science, philosophy, art, mathematics, design, architecture, and politics. SMR was founded by the Center for Philosophical Technology at Arizona State University, the Institute of so Social Sciences and Humanities, Skopje, the Department for Architecture Theory and Philosophy of Techniques at the Vienna, from which both uh, Vera Bullman and I are from, and the Critical Inquiry Lab at the Design Academy Eindhoven. SMR serves as a global hub for education, research, and as experimentation at the intersection of humanities, social sciences, creative fields, and the STEM sciences. So tonight, as I said already with us, uh, is uh, Vera Bullman. Vera Bullman is a professor for architecture theory at the Vienna University of Technology, where she directs the research unit, Architecture Theory and Philosophy of Technics, or ATTP. Together with uh, Ludger Hovestad and Elias Zafiris, she founded and co-directs the Digital Gnomonics uh, Research Group, which is uh, held between uh, TU Vienna, ETH Zurich, and Athens University. And among her latest publications are uh, her monograph, Information and Mathematics in the Philosophy of Michel Serre, published with Bloomsbury in 2020, as well as uh, Antwerp of the Method and Ethics of its Discourse, not on the Can Cartesian Rationalism Reconsidered, which will be published in the volume The Digital Continent, Anarchic Civility, Metaphysics of Copiousness, uh, with the uh, Teuka Academic Press, in, um, which is forthcoming. Uh, Ethic of, Ethics of Coding, a report on the algorithmic conditions, with a uh, volume edited with uh, Felicity Coleman, Iris van der Thuyen, and uh, Isaiah O'Donnell, uh, and part of the AU Horizon 2020 project. Then an article uh, entitled Photosynthesis published on Philosophy Today, 2019. And then uh, an another article uh, entitled Atomic Time and Quantum Literacy, Michel Serres' Apolo Apologia for Science, published uh, right, right now with the Minnesota Review. So uh, without further ado, I will leave you her to her lecture entitled Bodies of Thinking and the Fascist Affect. So Vera, the screen is yours. You are muted, I think. So. Yes, I, okay. Thanks, Ricardo, for, for the introduction and for moderating uh, tonight's session. I will, I will share my screen. So, yes. <clears throat> um, welcome, everyone. Nice you are here, even though it's a Saturday evening. Um, the title I chose is a complicated one, and I want to say uh, right from the start that I am myself not at all sure whether this is a good thing and whether it really can make sense in a yeah in a good sense <laughs> to begin to speak of um, the fascist affect. So. The point is not at all to join this kind of uh, ubiquitousness of, of this uh, ac accusation. No? I, every, everybody is calling everybody a fascist these days. And the idea with um, kind of re-attending re, re, re to, to this pre to, yeah, to the relation of homogeneity and heterogeneity in that sense is uh, not to join uh, this kind of talk, but rather to <clears throat> find orientation. Um, with regard to it again. I would like to start by um, reading the abstract, which I wrote. This is uh, not only for you, because it's also for me. It's a kind of, of a constellation of concepts around which I would just 
like to tell brief uh, episodes, let's say, or index points, um, some, some stories around that. Um, so this is not a proposal or a thesis or a debate position or anything of the sort. It is a rather speculative kind of approach, uh, which has to do with a long, a long term interest <clears throat> of mine of how to how to think about thinking at the body. No? So many people are, of course, preoccupied by that, but I believe more and more that it actually starts to make sense to think of something like bodies of thinking or bodies to think with. And the question is then, of course, what kind of bodies are there, are they? Because uh, uh, what interests me with this notion is actually a way to, um, to begin imagining something that, I don't know, in cognitive science, they might perhaps speak of the extended mind or of something like that. I prefer to <clears throat> relate it, uh, uh, let's say, to a, to a, to a longer, a longer term horizon of discourses, but it has to do with that. So, so there is this one, my work on Michel Serre has been, has been very influential in the last years. And if there is one statement maybe which, which kind of, um, uh, articulates well why uh, I find it so productive to 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 learn to think with um, with this peculiar way in which Michel Serre links literature, poetics, mathematics, the sciences, politics, the social, everything. It's perhaps this that he says um, that there is if there is an intelligence in the universe, then he says without a doubt it needs to be coextensive to it. So that's, you can read this statement obviously in many ways. The way that I pick it up in my book and also kind of in my approach of uh, philosophy of techniques is by um, taking very, uh, trying to take very, very literal in a sense and also very serious, this kind of maxim uh, that is uh, uh, deriving from, from such an, an interest in, in intelligence, which is the maxim which says that um, the real and the rational, or you could also say science and, 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 and philosophy, or you could also say um, nature, uh, so physics and, and cognition, you know, they need to be coextensive with each other. So it, it is not adequate to think of one as being derivative to the other, but they have a kind of a a co-evocative or a, a reciprocal relation. So there is a strong pre-concern with, a, you could say, a self-referentiality or a circularity, but just how to think of this without kind of drawing a graph of it in a, in a, in a static space or in a coordinated space. So bodies of thinking would be the kind of cognition which is impersonal, but tries to to, to achieve a kind of an, an, um, yeah, an equipollence, so an equality in terms of force, of abstraction, of, of, uh, of, of, uh, <clears throat> of power as well, and of, of, of value even, um, between the real and the rational. So these are impersonal bodies, but nevertheless, they change. So there's a kind of a, of a development. If we, if, we, if we attend to technology and, to, and to, to mathematics specifically, it becomes, I think, quite graspable no? when, we, when we think about nature and physics with the body of thinking of dynamics and of thermodynamics, then we can relate to this uh, nature in a different way than we look at it with the body of thinking of classical uh, physics of Newtonian forces that are all systematized through uh, gravity or when we think of it in uh, an Aristotelian notion of nature, for example. So bodies of thinking, they are not personal, but they are not ahistoric either. And that is um, one of the, yeah, of the lines or of the vectors that um, my talk will, will attend to. So <clears throat> what I sketched as a kind of a brief for this lecture, it's an abstract, but it's also a kind of an outlook at the same time, is this. Over the long term, there are two main philological lines with respect to what knowledge appears to be doing. No, so this is important. It's a kind of a pragmatic, so it's a doing which is a, at, the, at the core of the interest, not, the, not, not a representation of a truth. 
with respect to knowledge. But what does knowledge do in these bodies of thinking, which are not personal, but also not ahistorical? One line emphasizes the aspect of organizing a body of facts or teaching. The other, presumably quite a bit older, relates knowledge to the happening or having of sexual intercourse. So there is an intimacy involved with knowledge. This is um, a very perhaps antiquated sense of the, of the, of the word, but um, I think this is, this is one of the interesting aspects to pick up with um, what I have in mind with uh, thinking of yeah, an affect uh, that is related to homogeneity. So how to relate such intimacy of knowledge with publicness, no? so the publicness of knowledge. So from this maxim that I just talked about with Ser, that if there is an intellect, then it, is, it must be coextensive to the universe. No? So it's not the cause of the intellect or the origin of it, but it's extension, which is at stake. And, and in that respect, then knowledge is, is, uh, is, is public. That means knowledge does not comprehend everything there is to be known, <laughs> no? but it, knowledge in so far as it is public. And how can this publicness relate to such intimacy of knowledge? When we take seriously the new materialist idea of knowledge as being situated and engendered, then we cannot metaphorically think of knowledge in terms of buildings or canons, or in general, any kind of corpus, dead, silent, determined, serene. Rather, engendered and situated knowledge is active. There is a quickness to it, an interiority and an embodiment. How to address this? We often refer to knowledge now in terms of networks, fields, discourses, but none of these are very well capable of acknowledging a scale of interiority, an aspect of autonomy even, that would pertain impersonally to knowledge in its public status. What I want to consider here instead then is to think of knowledge's quickness in terms of how it actively cohabits with knowledges in impersonal bodies of thinking abstract, but at the same time, elemental and tempered. Each a public place, a place engendered by and through the active cohabitation of knowledges. Such public places embody, architectonically speaking, an ethos. They are neither fully undetermined, and here the word, the better word would actually be self-regulated. So they are neither fully self-regulated, capital body without organs, nor asexual, pure form, powerful because individually impotent, neither fertile nor productive, but prescriptive. So how to think this? There are two lines guiding my proposals in this lecture. One, in their quest for an ethical role of feminism in a mode of thought to come that would not unfold in object-centric formalism, nor in a subject-centric <clears throat> logic of the sext diat, Lucy Rigueray and Catherine Malabou, among others, remember the tradition of thought in terms of placemaking and material elements. I'm thinking here of Irigaray's elementary kind of being in touch as a kind of a contingency, and also Malabou's notion of plasticity. With respect to such thinking, there is a recycling kind of abundance of distinctness and likeness of bodies and their places. Nothing really in this thinking is ever at its proper place here. <clears throat> the second line follows the ambition to make a place where the fundamental affects or um, primary, aff primary, primary affects, I think Descartes called it, and the monist materialism of affect subordine geometrico. So the way Spinoza was speaking of affects. To think of a place where they could cohabit together in one and the same body of thinking. So what is at stake is to kind of you know, have a place, uh, to think, <laughs> think in a way where immanence and transcendence wouldn't be mutually exclusive. So <clears throat> I would like to start with an episode that has preoccupied me for a long time. And I, I still, I never really got, it was very hard to sort out what is happening here. Um, Gilles Deleuze and Michel Foucault, they were, of course, very good friends. And Michel Foucault was one of the yeah, first and very strong interpreters. Also, if you want um, um, 
kind of helping the Deleuzean thinking to, 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 a, to a much larger reception because of a very deep understanding. But there was one, there is one, one particular kind of um, a theme which has to do with desire and pleasure where they had a fallout. So I don't want to go into anecdotes of, of the biographical histories, but um, this fallout or their disagreement with respect to the position of these two terms was very strong. There is um, a beautiful collection of notes that Deleuze actually wanted to give Foucault, but Foucault, I think, never really had the time anymore. He was already very ill to respond to them. So I picked out some of the passages from this to see what, what is happening. Um, <clears throat> and then in the, in the next step also to see how this um, relates to, to, to this theme of the, of the fascism. At the core, it kind of gravitates around the question of power. So for Michel Foucault, there was a primacy of power um, whereas for Deleuze, there had to be a primacy of desire. The notion of pleasure in Foucault is mediated or, or, or kind of articulating itself through uh, what he calls power. But what they do share, and this is uh, nicely put here by, by Deleuze, he says uh, in this question, no, what, what they were both, where they were conspirators, if you want, where they had this deep understanding. Has Michel advanced in the problem which occupied us, namely how to maintain the rights of a microanalysis, diffusion, heterogeneity, piecemeal character, and yet find a sort of a unifying principle, which is not of the state, a party, a totalization, a representation type. So this is their joint interest. And around these two terms, there were limits of... Um, uh, being conspirators, let's say. Another passage here, I think, helps to clarify this. Deleuze writes, it's always Deleuze in the citations, no? So Deleuze writes, <clears throat> it's obviously a continuation, he says, so this permits me to respond to the question, which is necessary for me, but perhaps not necessary for Michel. How can power be desired? The first difference would this be that, for me, power is an affection of desire, having said that desire is never a natural reality. All of this is very approximate, the relations being more complicated between the two movements of deterritorialization and re-territorialization than I have put it here. But it is in this sense that desire seems to me to be primary and to be the element of a microanalysis. So this sentence is important. So desire is to be primary to power for Deleuze. Um, <clears throat> because one of the core questions that is that this, this approach with, with this super rich and very powerful approach with a kind of a, a, a movement between territorialization and re-territorialization that it circulates around is the question of desire. We will see in a, in a text I come to in a moment by Gattari, um, how he asks the question, so he says we need to, we need to treat the topic of fascism as um, a question that addresses uh, the role of desire within the social. So not, uh, yeah, we will see that in a moment. So Foucault thinks differently of power. In my understanding, whereas for Deleuze, the, the, the main, the main um, interest is, this, uh, is the social, Deleuze never let go really of, of, a, of, of something natural, of something physical. So power, I think, and when he speaks of a micro um, analysis and then also a micro mechanics and so on, he is much more with physics, I would say. And there is an interesting, so this relation is, is an interesting one to pick up. Deleuze continues in a later passage, he says, the last time we saw each other, Michel says to me with much kindness and affection, something like, I cannot bear the word desire. Even if you use it in another way, I can't stop thinking or living that desire equals lack or that desire is the repressed. Michel adds, 
As for me, what I call pleasure is perhaps what you call desire, but in any case, I need another word than desire. Evidently, it is again something other than a question of words. Since as for myself, I can hardly bear the word pleasure. But why? For me, desire does not compromise any lack. Neither is it a natural given. So this is interesting. Not it, so it, so we will see, I will give a lot of emphasis on the one hand to the digital and on the other to philology. And why I'm doing that has to do with this. So it's, a, it's obviously about words, but it cannot be sorted by just using other words. No, so it's something else that is at stake. <clears throat> Deleuze elaborates more on on his uh, on his um, uh, uh, let's say on his on his uh, he's not his, his discomfort with pleasure. He explains. He says, "I cannot give any positive value to pleasure because pleasure seems to me to interrupt the imminent process of desire. Pleasure seems to me to be on the one side of strata and organization." to be on the side of strata and organization. And it is in the same movement that desire is presented as internally submitted to law and externally interrupted by pleasures. In the two cases, there is negation of a field of imminence proper to desire. And this I think is the crucial sentence. Pleasure seems to me to be the only means for a person or a subject to find themselves again in a process which overwhelms them. It is a re-territorialization. And from my point of view, it is in the same way that desire is related to the law of luck and the norm of pleasure. I don't want to comment too much. I think these words speak quite clearly to themselves. So what I want to suggest is to think of you know, this, so a process which overwhelms them. It makes a difference if we want to think of this process primarily as a social process or as a natural process, a physical process, so a, a, which comprehends even the social. So, and in, in many ways, um, this, this, uh, this idea of a bodies of thinking, it, it needs to kind of provide a place for those, for both of them to, to cohabit. That would be the idea. So the question was uh, asked by Deleuze himself. Now he, he wanted to find a way to, to continue thinking with, the, with Foucault on this. And he put it like this. He said, can I really think of equivalences like what for me is a body without organs and th that desires corresponds to what is for Michel body pleasures? Can I relate the body flesh distinction of what Michel has spoken to me to the body without organs organization distinction? So this is always in the background when I'm, when I'm thinking of um, this bodies, bodies of thinking, <laughs> bodies to think with. But I want to complicate it perhaps a bit more by um, bringing in what neither of them really attended to. So we have, no, in my optics, no, I'm not saying this is the true or the right or not at all the only right one, but there is a point of uh, having physics and the social um, as, as a kind of keeping, keeping them apart in this interest. And I'm very much, I got more and more interested in plants. And there is a, um, a, a point, a point um, presented by Emanuele Kocha, but it's, it's, I actually know it, I, I, I began to like it from, from, uh, from Peter Sloterdijk, from the first volume of, of the, uh, the Bubbles, uh, and the first volume of the Spheres trilogy. It, it has to do with the relation between container and, contain, and containment. And uh, Kocha describes this beautifully as a kind of a plant mode of thought. He writes, <clears throat> so from this point of view, that would be the life of plants, a metaphysics of mixture, that's, that's the title of his book. From this point of view, plants challenge one of the pillars of the biological and natural sciences of the past few centuries, the priority of the environment over the living, of the world over life, of space over the subject, 
plants in their history and evolution demonstrate that living beings produce the space in which they live rather than being forced to adapt to it. They have modified the metaphysical structure of the world for good. We are invited to conceive of the physical world as a collection of all objects, the space that includes the totality of everything there was, is and will be. The definitive horizon that no longer tolerates any exteriority, the absolute container. In making possible the world of which they are both part and content, plants destroy the topological hierarchy that seems to reign over our cosmos. They demonstrate that life is a rupture in the asymmetry between container and contained. Oh, oh. When there is life, the container is located in the contained and is thus contained by it and vice versa. The paradigm of this mutual overlap is what the ancients called breath or pneuma. To blow, to breathe means in fact to have this experience. What contains us, the air, becomes contained in us. And conversely, what was contained in us becomes what contains us. To breathe means to be immersed in a medium that penetrates us with the same intensity as we penetrate it. Plants have transformed the world into the reality of breath, and it is startling from this topological structure which life has given to the cosmos, and I will attempt to describe in this book the notion of world. So, <clears throat> um, part of this interest in a body of thinking and in this bridging between, between, between I, yeah, I called it uh, nature and poetics in my book, uh, is this question of an intimacy that is constitutive, but at the same time, um, no, constitutive for knowledge, but at the same time, it cannot claim, let's say, to be, a rec no, ha <laughs> if you recognize intimacy, you lose it. So the notion of publicness of knowledge has a lot to do with, uh, with a tangled, uh, I don't know if it would be best called a chiastic, a chiasmic uh, relation between, between these levels, container and contained. What is at stake if we if we manage to think this is what 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 I call what we call this is inspired from from Elias uh, Zafiri as well, an inversion. No, an inversion is a very complicated figure of thought, or um, I would say because it involves negation and affirmation, but on multiple layers on multiple layers of of, uh, of of reference, and this game between uh, multiple layers of reference that are involved in an inversion that we can think, so we can think an inversion, but an inversion presupposes an alienation of the point of view from which we try to think. And, and the, the, the promise of a body of thinking would be to provide a place where this can happen, where this can be a social practice. No, not a mystic and a private one, but become a social one. So this is the interest with the plant mode of, of thinking. In relation to this emphasis on the mechanics or the physics that we have with um, uh, the background of, of uh, a pleasure and desire, what we just looked at. Now I want to add another component, another uh, yeah, star in the sky <laughs> of this constellation with Lucy Rigueray. So some of you probably know her book. It's a very powerful book. She called it Elemental Passions. And what is, in, what is of interest to me very much is that she begins to reconnect with the tradition of thinking elements. No? So elements, it's a bit like with, with the plant here. I mean, the, the, so the pneuma or the movement is, is the photosynthesis that plants are capable of. No? And, and um, what it engages is, in a way, this very old notion of having elements of nature, so fire, water, earth, and air. And they are elements in the sense that everybody that is natural is composed of them, but in different, uh, in different relations. Yeah. So, and this is what Erie Gray also picks up, but now with respect to passions. So with respect to, uh, the, to the soul, if you want to, so something like elements or an elementarization of passions, which is in relation to, to the soul. The way she begins, and I will not cite a lot from her book, just two passages. Um, the way she begins is like this. She says, man is divided between two transcendencies, his mothers and his gods, whatever kind of God that may be. 
These two transcendencies are doubtless not unrelated, but this is something which he has forgotten. His mother is transcendent to him because she is of a different genre and she gives birth to him. He is born of an other who is always other inappropriable. Yeah, so very strong um, topic, let's say, in, in feminist thought. Now, rather than developing this uh, uh, further, the point that I am most interested in right now is this one here. So first of all, what does this have to do with an amorous economy? So this term, an amorous economy, not an economy of, of desire or, or, a, or a libidinal economy. She calls it an amorous economy because she is talking about the passions of the soul very outspokenly. And the problem she sees is, or the, the relevancy actually of going to the level of elements is this here in my understanding. No? She says, it is a choice which also in the end neutralizes society. And this kind of neutralization uh, is, is, uh, is, is troubling. And it's a neutralization of society, which in, in, a, in, in my understanding does not play within, um, let's say, social orders. No, that is also the link to the topic of, um, of the homogeneity uh, uh, that, that, I, that I put uh, in the title. So there is a neutralization um, <clears throat> happening, but how, so if we accept the two, them, no, the, fem the female and the, and the male, no, the mother and the gods, as two transcendencies, is there not a way to pluralize modes of neutralization? So modes of neutralization, which would then not directly render uh, the relations of, of the sexual relations into uh, into the into the ontological distinctions, but into an abstraction of those which which uh, could be embodied by these impersonal bodies of thinking, which are not outside of time, and which are genuinely public. No. So not um, not divine or natural in that sense, but rhetorical public technical, logical, formal, and so on. Um, <clears throat> my book, which will be forthcoming, which is a kind of, um, so trying to see what I can do now with all these, all these shifted, shifted, um, shifted figures of thinking that I learned with uh, this preoccupation with Michel Serre. I titled it The Digital Continent on the relation between nature and poetics. And the point is precisely this. So can we think this, this, uh, this relation of the plant mode of thinking between, uh, con between containment and being contained, between content and, uh, and, and container, this uh, yeah, almost mystical relation, can we think it as being constituted through code? I call it here the digital because the digital is the most powerful articulation of code today, but code uh, in, in the way that I relate to it is always uh, mathematical. So it doesn't come with the computer and it doesn't come with the binary either. It is much vaster than that, but it is code which, which always establishes the transparency that, uh, that underlines um, um, uh, 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 alphabets or number classes and so on. So that which constitutes it, but never itself becomes topical. So code in a, in a, in a very uh, extended sense. And the idea is, can we think of, the, of code in our uh, current time today in the form of the digital as constituting something like a continent of bodies of thinking? And then the continent is more something like the encyclopedia. No? So it's a public place. It's not the truth. It's not the next world. It's not an evolutionary transcendence into, uh, into, into a kind of a transhuman or next historical stage or age or something like that. It is an architectonic place, like, like, like the, a bit like the encyclopedia. And that play, I mean, in it, I would like to think is an interplay between nature and poetics, a kind of a natural communication. But there's a physics in it as well. That's why the nature is there. I, I, I won't elaborate on that much, but I want to show you this one phenomena of optics, of quantum optics that inspired a lot, that is very, yeah, 
that is that is helping to grasp something uh, concretely about what 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 may be in the background of this, and it's um, it's a new field, a rather new field, caustic light. No. But I picked here a, not really a specific philosophical book which interprets it. It's a recent PhD thesis summing up and and uh, outlining what this kind of research entails, but. The foreword puts quite nicely what I think is so interesting about it. So he says, everyone has seen the optical phenomenon of caustics in nature and daily life. And I don't have a picture now, but if, for example, if the, if the sun shines through the water surface and then you see patterns of, of uh, almost like burning lines below the water. So these, these phenomena, they are what is called caustic. So in the form of bright focal lines, now, the interesting thing is that there is a geometry to think the, the physical voluminosity of these focal lines. So they're not representations, they're not drawings. This abrupt increase of the light field's intensity in these phenomena is a consequence of the discontinuous change of the spatial ray density in the vicinity of the caustic. As a caustic, and this is really the crucial point, is the envelope of rays. So the caustic is a kind of a geometry <laughs> of rays of light. But the surfaces of this geometry appears to be burning. This is, this is a very philosophically, when we think in this tradition of the elements, this is a very, very powerful kind of um, new knowledge. No, knowledge in the sense of public, since we have a mathematics to describe it, since we have an optics, so there is a, a, a physics to it. It's not only the phenomena they are, of course, very, very old, but that we can rationalize it in this way is powerful. So, <clears throat> in what way <laughs> no? would such a relation to, to, to light or to the physics of light um, be powerful? There, is, there are two main ideas that I now want to, to, uh, to, to briefly introduce. One is First of all, with this light, we don't, it's, um, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's not about tracing, it's not about following up traces so much. It's not about moving and, and a Spurensuche in German, but it's a kind of an adventurous nest that doesn't move. It stays on the spot. It stays on the spot in a similar way, like plants don't move, no? but they're totally active. <laughs> so the idea is that, um, uh, uh, knowledge or, or learning, learning to know things has something to do with a kind of a physics or a physical communication that is that involves something like photosynthesis. So light has always been this metaphor for insight and understanding and so on. But what if we could treat it physically? So then, uh, what if if uh, gaining an insight is a bit like feeding on on light, like plants feed on light, no? and they grow and they change. The influence, uh, they have climatic, clim a climatic kind of activity. So then what would the concept be? I will come back to this. The idea is not, the concept would not just be um, kind of metaphors. So vessels with which to transport things, but an architectonics of these metaphors. So then these, these vessels or you know, that can transport knowledge, that can mobilize it, and put it in, no, have it in, in the encyclopedia, or in our case now, this kind of uh, abstract continent. It has an architectonics which bounds two infinities. One, towards the inside, it bounds a void, and towards the outside, it bounds against an infinity. So it has active relations to both, the infinite as well as the void. This is the powerful idea of the amphoras. And we could think of such amphoras as a kind of an architectonics of caustics. So this is obviously an outlook, so I have not sorted this out, but I hope I can make it a bit clearer what, what this would feel like, what, what, what kind of questions or movement in thinking that we would do. Um, <clears throat> this caustics then becomes something like, a, it's a bit of like a time traveling, but not through history. No? And this time traveling, um, would be rendered to give a picture of, the, of this continent. So the continent is, is not a territory, it's abstract, and it's never finite, because the more we find out, like 
doing an optics that 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 can that can uh, rationalize ca caustic light phenomena adds to the extent of this continent. So it's a it's a notion in terms of space, but it's it's neither finite nor infinite. Um, but this extent, we can think of it as as, as a, a tunneling or, or, or sheaving, bundling temporalities. So then this continent would involve something that we could uh, call like an extent in the first instance, instead of speaking of an origin, either in a coordinate system or in historical terms, and an extent in the last instance. And the digital spans the whole extent between the two, but they are, they are um, notions like, like um, the North Pole or the South Pole. No? So they are always involved in every moment in between. They're not a line, they're not a linear development. I call this the uttermost extent and the most absolute extent. So, and then it, this travels <laughs> where, you, where you don't move from the spot. They, they, are, they are the travels or the movement that bodies of thinking can do um, in the extent of such an abstract domain. Let me read how um, the introduction to this, to this book starts. So it's an invitation to a world, a world trip, uh, Tour du Monde, considering the stars in the sky. And the stars in the sky is mainly important because it's about, we don't have a reference layer uh, uh, to, to ground things, but we have constellations that keep in cycles. So the earth is passing in the sun stream. Its pantropic place in the universe is to the utmost or most absolute extent a whereabouts, a place of aware that finds its spot by setting itself off from an about. Embarking on a world tour by considering the stars in the skies concerns a kind of traveling that actively figures out how not to move. How to think of this cosmic extent that pertains to such pantropic notion of place? With plant mentality as an adventure in botanic thought, like plants whose metabolism involves photosynthesis, thought feeds on light. Might the life of thought be like the life of plants, an ongoing cosmogony, the restless genesis of our cosmos? Through plants, life articulates itself cyclically. Fauna and flora circulate vivacity. They are not so much separate kingdoms, but rather spheres of sustenance, inseparable and yet contingent one upon the other in symbiosis. Across the spheres, life engenders itself cyclically within the heterogeneity of forms, the distinction of species, the ways of life. Plants participate in the coming to be of their own milieu, but their existence has always affected the cosmic milieu at large, the whole wild world which they imbue, impregnate and penetrate, and which in turn imbues, impregnates and penetrates them. They engendered the atmosphere for animal life before the first footed beings strolled through deserts, forests or swam through waters. Is thought not like plants reaching out towards the skies while staying put on its grounds? For a plant mentality, the existence of any form of being is a cosmogonic act in which being and doing coincide. A world is inevitably in status nascendi, in a state of delivering itself through its own engendering. In its adventurous and botanic modes, then, thought involves vessels that carry, carry the wherewith from an elsewhere to the location of an active whereabout. We can think of such vessels as furnishings of conviviality. Such vessels are ideated, but they are neither concepts nor metaphors. They are amphoras. They articulate space in two canonic determinations, that it extends and that it divides. Space must be thought as spacing, as granting space, and thus as an allowance of a space and as a clearing out, and thus as allowing the emptiness of space. This is a citation from Werner Hamacher, from which this idea of the amphoras uh, is, is, uh, is inspired. Amphoras organize the categoricity of this double determination that renders space active as a spacing. Amphoras are jugs that are doubly bounded. Place in its pantropic articulation is open because it must keep apart the two boundaries at the same time as it holds them together. 
Places in this sense give way to an emptiness that is neither a thing nor an interval, but a cipher. Such emptiness constitutes pantropic places as the whereabouts of a domain that is common not through belonging, but only through the impacting participation of all that this domain accommodates. Pantropic places are not discrete, they are discretion itself. In this active sense, this domain is public. Amphoras embody how each whereabout spans and conjoins an uttermost extent with the most absolute extent. The world that is toured in an adventure of botanic mentality, wells from encircling and englobing the difference between a doubled way of thinking extent, a surface or area covered maximally, an uttermost extent, an extent in the last instance, and the surface or area covered without diminishing any of its facets, an absolute extent, an extent in the first instance. If the two were to coincide, the world would have disappeared. Touring the world as an adventure in botanic thought is a lofty endeavor carried by the winds of a longing that is both cosmogenic and cosmogonic. It keeps the uttermost and the absolute at once conjoined and apart by casting off the abouts of a where that is delivered from their non-coincidence. This lofty endeavor casts itself off by unfolding from the radiant where within of this non-coincidences spot. So <clears throat> what this wants to, so again, no, the focus is heterogeneity, homogeneity. Both because we have, we need to, we need to learn thinking in circular ways. And this idea of a body of thinking, no, how could it not? reproduce itself? How could it not inevitably populate, <laughs> let's say, the world of thought in a homogeneous way, ultimately in a homogeneous way? So the idea with this, um, with this milieu, with the relation to the milieu or the plant mode, is to think about copiousness, again, in the pre-modern sense. No? Copia etymologically means the plenty. Copiare literally means to transcribe, to write in plenty. So there is a relation um, or one another way to speak of what makes the architectonics of such vessels, of such amphoras, which are doubly bounded, would be the relation between transcription and translation. No? Transcription is, is uh, not engaged with, with, with any kind of understanding. It's a purely metrical way to capture the speech, the articulated speech of somebody. Um, whereas translation, of course, involves a kind of a, a conveying, a conveying of, uh, of, 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 the, of, of a text into another language. And <clears throat> the idea is to think of, of uh, this relation between transcription and translation or of an amphora in terms um, of figuration. So the body of thinking will al always only produce figures, figures of thought. No? Modes of speaking, of course, so, so figures of speech as well, but what it manifests is figures of thought. So figures of thought would be perhaps another way to address these amphoras. And the figure in this understanding which I take from a very beautiful book by David Reed. I can highly recommend it um, to read because it introduces figures of thought in how they are articulated um, in mathematical texts by looking at mathematical texts as literary texts. So it's uh, David. What David Reed does is he looks at how specifically Euclid, uh, uh, then Descartes, and then. Um, and then uh, Hilbert, they were both, all, all three of them would reinterpret the element, geometric elements, no, in, in major steps. So, so, so Euclid, Descartes, and Hilbert. And what he looks at is how they were actually writing about this, because there is no formal convention in which they could express what they had to say. Yeah? So if you reinterpret the elements, you cannot directly 
uh, uh, fit your thoughts into the formats which are already there. So he reads specifically mathematical texts as literary texts, not in the sense that he wants to say they are just fiction, no? not in that sense at all, but in how in a, how a text can be crafted to convey such an enormous, um, let's say, uh, inversion of thought, because elements are being brought into constellations in a new way. From this book, there is this one passage, which for me is very important. He writes, figure is the context in which definition and delimitation are the same thing. For to give a definition of a figure is to give its boundary, and to give its boundary is to give the figure as definition and as boundary. In this, you can see this, this, this kind of casting off, no? so staying on the spot, but delivering yourself through figuring something out in your thinking from the spot in which you are. So this is this plant mode. It's very central for this plant mode of thinking that that I, I would like to, to add to the, let's say, the, the, the physics and the social or the uh, sex and, and, uh, and gender discussions. And with this, I now want to come to the difficult part, <laughs> um, this idea, the fascist affect. No. So as a concept, actually, I picked it up when I was um, in a whole, so one full day driving in the car, listening to everything I could find by Achille Membe. And he is speaking, as, as you know, <clears throat> of, of, uh, yeah, of these of this, uh, recent developments and of, of uh, uh, what he, he speaks of disposable bodies suddenly in the, in the global uh, uh, relations of climate saving, yeah, climate saving and, and uh, globalization and migration and, and, and uh, all of these difficult constellations we are in right now. He begins to speak of disposable bodies and he was speaking of the fascist affect. I couldn't find the passage anymore. So I took the term and I tried to sort out what that could mean. No, what, what, could that, what could that mean? Or was it maybe even a misunderstanding? I am not sure. But I, what I found and how I proceeded was by looking at um, this text by Felix Gattari. Now everyone wants to be a fascist. Um, and the question I had with respect to it, um, basically relates the motif of this text to, the, to a motif which has always influenced me a lot by an anthropologist, by Mary Douglas, from a book which is entitled uh, Purity and, and Taboo, I think, where she develops this, this um, very powerful idea of how could we even think of dirt. No? Dirt, she says there, she argues, is matter out of place. Well, this makes a lot of sense if we retrospectively try to understand um, the processes of purification and also hygienics and so on. If you really think about it, how is it that matter can be out of place? No. So the notion of place um, always meant it was related to, to matter through elements. So not matter as either particles or, 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 uh, or even wave, wave particles, dualities, but filtered or put in constellations through elements. And this, to relate the two, I think is important because while we will see this in a moment, I will show you passages in the text. For Gattari, this, uh, this, this really extremely important text, um, uh, which, which, which argues that, um, no, every, so everyone wants to be a fascist means, it's not like only bad people do that, or that in history there were episodes or there were kinds of, of, of events that we call like that, but he, to a certain extent, naturalizes it no? through will. It's a, it becomes a question of will. And with respect to the topics that we are now much more than um, at the time when he wrote his texts, uh, pretty concerned is of course climate and the kind of a propriety or a, a, a balances uh, in, in, in respect to the climate. I will come back to this in a moment. Let's look at uh, Qatari's text first. So he begins by writing. I have chosen to discuss fascism for several reasons, because it is a real political problem and not purely theoretical consideration, 
and because I think it is a key theme to use in approaching the question of desire in the social realm. Besides, isn't it a good idea to discuss it freely while we still can? No. So this is actually one of the uh, lines at least which, which resonates a lot through how I want to talk about it now. I'm not sure if it is still possible to discuss it freely, I'm not sure if it ever was, but if we talk about the public nature of knowledge, nothing less I think is at stake. So <clears throat> he emphasizes a lot context, no? So he says, it seems neither desirable nor possible I do not think that a system of concepts can function with validity outside of its original environment, outside of the collective dispositions of enunciation which produced it. And then he picks up the same, no, this, 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 um, this tension between pleasure and desire, where there is so much more at stake than words or preferences. He says much of the talk about pleasure is very interesting, but in contrast with desire, it is absolutely impossible to transfer these two notions drawn from a certain type of practice and a certain vision of psychoanalysis to the social field. So pleasure cannot be transported to the social field, he says. In no way do they help us grasp the functioning of the libido in a fascist situation. Um, <laughs> We saw in the short episode with Deleuze and Foucault how at stake is a kind of a, 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 a political activity. So uh, with the deterritorialization, um, Gattari picks up the same point. He says, no, the, the starting point is simple. It is not possible to bind together in the same sentence the term pleasure with revolution. Because this, this term pleasure operates as a kind of a coming to oneself. No? And, and a revolution is about um, the inverse movement. So there is a relation that is almost inverse to it. And now what he what he what he what he foregrounds with this is of course um, an imminence philosophy, a philosophy of imminence in which this individuation can 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 happen um, yeah, continuously not uh, in, a, in a process of, of uh, uh, realizing a form, but rather a, a continuous process which involves alienations. And that's also the sense in which Foucault wrote in the introduction to, to, to Deleuze and Gattari's books, book, uh, Mille Plateau, that it's really a kind of a manual to a non-fascist life. Because through this emphasis of individuation, it, it, uh, it wards off a purification but now let's look at this text, which is much later. It's from 2015. And when I read it, it was a, almost a bit of a shock, <laughs> if I may say so. Um, because she, she picks up the beauty and the limits of a monist, uh, uh, of a monist approach to the question of the public of the public and of, of the relation of knowledge and the public. So not the social, but the public. She begins by describing um, the beauty of Spinoza's approach. So God is without a name, it is without a shape. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a reference um, to, to, to a notion of imminence, which is almost totally self-regulating. And she, she asks the question in this text, the title is Before and Above, no? Spinoza and Symbolic Necessity. She asks the question, is it fair? Is this a fair reading of Spinoza? So if we celebrate um, this materialist philosophy of affect, which unfolds its ethics in a processual way, in an involved, in an embodied way, and in an, in an imminent way, are we, are we, doing, are we being fair to Spinoza? And what she adds to this um, famous work is an emphasis on his uh, theological political treatise. And I don't want to make this very long. It's obviously very complicated, but 
if we just look at the table of contents of Spinoza's treatise, we see that it's all about free speech. It's all about free speech, but the reasons why he emphasizes so much free speech, so this is the argument she makes, no? she says, um, in this political theological uh, um, uh, treatise, Spinoza seems to be advocating almost the opposite of what he does in the imminent, uh, in, in the ethics. Because in the ethics, if the processes are essentially self-regulated and imminent, then in, 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 in this treatise, he emphasizes the necessity to allow for free speech in public. And the reasons why, uh, in this political, that's why it's called political theological treatise as well, is that there is always a sense of, of, um, of revelation. I cannot elaborate this now. She goes quite to, into detail. There is, so th the promise of the Spinozian God is that it's, uh, there is no, he doesn't occupy a position of eminence. So he is not above. Um, what can be learned if one engages with it. So it's purely imminent. But nevertheless, that's what she points out, there is a relation to the sacred involved. And this makes it necessary to relate expression at the expressed, again, to processes of uh, signification. And through this relation, on a fundamental level, no, there are irreconcilabilities between the different religions. So the free speech is there in Spinoza's political treatise, not to give a predominance or let's say a homogenization to one of the religions. I just use here to give you an index of what is at stake. No? So in Christianity, um, the body, physical body, embody knowledge and embody Christ. No. So there's an, an element of incarnation, which, is, which, which also makes uh, such a strong relation between the modern, modern notion of science with Christianity. And it differs radically, for example, with the way how um, God is present in the, old, in the sense of the Old Testament, where it's all through the name. No? So all things there articulate the name of, the, of God. These are just two examples. All of the different religions differ at precisely this level. I would call this a categorical level, which can not really be sorted out imminently. So, so this, is, this is the background why uh, this public treatise in Spinoza is important. And when we now look at... Um, so there is a lot of the interest in, in imminence and in, 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 in Spinoza, also in the Deleuze and Gattari, though the coding that captures is, of course, in relation to a computational approach to matter. The French have a really interesting um, story of how they came to call the computer l'ordinateur. Um, they were thinking of what does a computer do then? And they were thinking of this in a very bodily way. They were thinking of calling it. Um, here are the words, you know, a, a combinator or a congester, I'm not sure, so to make congestion, or a digester, so to digest, like a, a, a metabolic process. Many others, until they settled then on ordinateur, um, an, an, an ordination of the electronic. And this kind of, of material computation um, or the, the role of the material code, it introduces, I think, a relevancy similar to the notion of the public that uh, was Spinoza's other concern in this treatise. How to get out of this, no? or what to do? It is clear that both Spinoza and also um, Leibniz that they introduced a preoccupation with an infinitesimal, no? with an imminent continuous uh, infinitesimal uh, process, which uh, in Descartes was not there. But let's at this point come very briefly to, to, to this point here. I said in the beginning that this, this place, 
that should cohab should afford should accommodate Descartes' approach to the passions of the soul and Spinoza's geometrical ethics. So what Descartes does in the passions of the soul is to, to, to produce a kind of an elementaricity of, of, the, of the passions. He says there are primary passions and they are six in his case. They are wonder, they are love, hate, desire, joy, and sadness. And all of the passions that one experiences are made of these elements. So it's an element uh, approach, almost like um, in, 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 the, in the metaphysical elements of fire, water, earth, and air. And what it allows him to, 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 to do then is to say, well, we can relate in an, in, a, in, a, in an analytical way to our passions without involving God. That is the important uh, statement. Because with these elements, every particular passion is also an active, also has an active part. And this relation um, is similar here. But here there is no geometrical, or so with Descartes there is no particular geometrical order, while in Spinoza mm, there is. No, it's a divine one, but it's a geometric one. And <clears throat> to accommodate this, Michel Serre made a proposal in his thesis on Leibniz, because Leibniz was uh, like an in between the two. And what it involves is a reconsidering of the relation between um, the cos cosmologies, between the, the Ptolemaean and the Copernican worldviews. Now, the Copernican says, okay, the Earth um, is not at the center, <laughs> whereas for the Ptolemaean, the Earth is. No, no, for the Copernican, the Sun is, and the Earth is circling around the Sun. So this is a kind of an inversion which re, you know, it reorganizes a, a thought in a very profound way. And what is interesting today is that we indeed, with, uh, with logistics, with GPS, for example, the technology which we imply is Ptolemaean, whereas um, the Copernican uh, thought is very much preoccupied with earth, with water, and with, with, uh, with, with, with heat, so with transformations of heat. Um, what Michel Serre now proposed is to say that what we can do with, resp with respect to knowledge is to make mathematical models. And these mathematic, for these mathematical models, the Copernican and the, and the Ptolemaean, they don't follow each other historically in terms of uh, becoming modern or, or you know, in, in a progress kind of way. But rather, I make this a bit short now as well. He has very striking points. He says, our sun must be the earth of some other sun as the earth was the sun for Ptolemy. Yeah. There's another passage here. So the Ptolemy is the Copernicus of the earth and Copernicus is the Ptolemy of the sun. And these inversions, that's what um, the mathematical models in Serre's philosophy are all about. Um, so it's a pluralization, not only of worlds, but also of suns. And whether we change in the way that we, that we, that we make it accountable, whether we, we change from a Ptolemaean way of doing that or a Copernican way of doing that, um, we can remain undecided between the two. And this is because at the core, Leibniz is a translator here. He says, the point of view of Leibniz, which invests in these mathematical models, is to decipher the languages of the different worldviews as two different languages, but designating a single meaning. So translation from center to center, not translation from one reference language into a destination language but from center to center. <laughs> so the point I want to suggest is that this kind of, of, uh, of modeling, of abstract modeling, it not only gives us coded ways of treating knowledge, so what we literally produce in the digital, in all these uh, databases and, and um, 
the mathematical uh, yeah, formulations of what we know. But <clears throat> it also foregrounds a relation to, to translation that can remain undecided with respect to reference orders like these. No? So it, 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 creates, it creates abstract figures <laughs> and the reference of these abstract figures could be something like public uh, bodies of thinking. Yeah, if we can see in the discussions, if this is very new to you with the Ptolemaean and the Copernican, we can go into more details. Otherwise, I think time is running fast. And I would like to show you from the point of um, philology, so of the words that are involved in such mathematical models that are constituted by translations, A quite a literary scenario of how we could imagine this to be. This is by um, Georg Steiner, a philologist, um, who wrote this book, which is entitled Real Presences. Is there anything in what we say? No? So to make the share, so different languages, but they make, to assume that they make the same reference. Uh, this is also what he, what he starts from. And he begins, interestingly, because it's not often that people make reference today to, to, uh, to the coordinating, so to the double coordination uh, of the Ptolemaean uh, thinking. He, be he begins with this, with this strange anecdote. He says, this is the, the, the start of the book. We speak still of sunrise and sunset. We do so as if the Copernican model of the solar system had not replaced ineradicably the Ptolemaic. Vacant metaphors, eroded figures of speech inhabit our vocabulary and grammar. They are caught tenaciously in the scaffolding and recesses of our common parlance. There they rattle about like old rags or ghosts in the attic. So he wants to talk about the meaning of meaning but as a wagger, no, as a wagger. So it cannot be resolved as a wagger. And what he invites us to think instead is of what he calls um, a fiction or a fable of a society. Imagine a society in which all talk about the arts, music and literature is prohibited. In this society, all discourse, oral or written, about serious books or paintings or pieces of music is held to be illicit verbiage. So that's a drastic kind of inversion. So in the Republic, the arts were uh, expulsed. And he wants to think a society in which the mediators are expulsed. He goes through. So he calls this a philological, this form is philological. And he follows through by saying that there is a life to active thought, which invests itself in the interpretation of it. And this is um, what the political engagement with knowledge and with the publicness of knowledge would, uh, would, would suppose to be. I wanted to give you this as a reference. It is not exactly what I have in mind with the, the digital as a continent. It would be more something like an ethics or towards an ethics that could, um, that could go towards this. I think at this point, I stop. Let's um, have some, some discussion about it. Thanks, Vera. Um, so, yeah, I would open the floor for questions. I th yeah, I think we have uh, at least, I guess, 15 minutes. But perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps I can start. Oh, no, there's a, we have a question. From Lorenzo, I think. So, 
So I will read it out. Uh, in the relationship between the outside, the container, um, the inside, the contained, the amphora at the same time affirms and inverts this relation of container and contained. In this sense, it seems to me that the nature of the contained physically becomes one of the interiority of a place that is bounded and therefore determined. This place, a room, really seems to be a place where intimately humans can be static but active like plants and wave with knowledge. At the same time, the outdoors remains the space of the public physically where we speak with others. A very broad question arises. What is the nature of these double facades? Uh, you're muted there. Great question. I would say this nature, we have an echo here. Okay. This nature of the double facade, it's cryptic. Yeah. So what we can say about it is it's architectonic, so how it is made. So that would be the relation between code, code and, and uh, so how code constitutes reference relation, no? a representation and reference relations. So there is an architectonics to it. This is not cryptic, but how it does it um, or, or its nature um, is intellectual, I guess. Yeah, perhaps to follow up on that. Um, so you, at the beginning, you were talking about um, so this kind of uh, querel between uh, power, desire, and pleasure. Uh, <clears throat> and I wonder if we could understand, let's say, the unease of Foucault and also the, let's say, the yeah, the, 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 the debate with uh, with Deleuze. Um, so as related to the fact that somehow uh, these terms like pleasure and desire still refer um, to a kind of uh, calculus setup, no? So there is a border, there is a lack, and there is a self-fulfillment, and they can index this border only in terms of lack or trespassing or self-containment but they never really questioned the, let's say, the architectonic nature of this very border. Whereas, you know, already with Kocha and then with all the reference you showed, then what is matters is not really the border in itself, but the fact that this border is there uh, placed, uh, let's say, in terms of uh, continent or uh, architectonics. Yes. Yes, this is, I think, um, exactly the crucial point. So the architectonics of it is not addressed with it. No, in in I would say in in both in both of the I'm I'm not too well familiar with uh, the really late work of of Foucault, but what is what is I think what is addressed, especially perhaps by Foucault, is a kind of an an interiorization no? or a kind of an edif so then the, the pleasure allows for a kind of an edification so in the old sense building the selves. No, which which in itself is becoming constitutive for a so, for a social as well, but it's an interiorization of it. And on that, I think uh, Foucault is actually quite close to Descartes. So with Descartes, uh, the preconcern, so for example, with wonder as a primary passion, was precisely this. So wonder was. Uh, uh, so a, a radical uh, openness uh, to everything that one is not and one does not understand. But with the effect of um, interiorizing it, so of, of um, yeah, of, of this inner 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 kind of, of articulation, and in Deleuze it's almost inverse, no? So it's it's a kind of an um, to exhaust oneself into processes where you always try to get rid of yourself as much as of references that are dominant. So there is it's a kind of a, a an inverse relation, but the the role of code itself not code as a servant to a function, but the constitutive, the architectonic role of code itself is not really addressed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there any other questions? I have one. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I am, let's just uh, say I'm a little bit confused, but uh, a lot of pointers that uh, seem sort of, I can sense a familiarity to something, um, let's say from the 70s. So I'm, I, I guess I'm asking something specifically about, uh, is there a way for you to point out how the, the relationship between this, this vessel, I guess I'm also following up a little bit from what Lorenzo asked, this vessel and its relation to uh, matter and not, uh, let's say, a way of thinking where previously the place or the vessel would be thought in elements or uh, elemental sort of thinking of the matter. Uh, is there a way for you to point out how it's different or what specifically makes this different for you from the discourse of, and there was an attempt to make it public back then, at least from what I can tell now, uh, discourse of, let's say, syntax or, or trace in works of, especially Eisenman or the discourse between Eisenman and, and Derrida, and the only thing that I can, I guess, sort of think of or sense here in your work is that you are um, uh, trying to avoid a certain, maybe, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but avoid a certain dependence on uh, the encounter by a, a subject of, of this place, which is what sort of dominated uh, Eisenman's obsession with traces because it is also the last time I can think of where in architectural discourse there was a interiority really discussed but because of its relation to uh, especially in the houses the, the syntactical moves and uh, the apparent sort of irrationality of it uh, uh, the making public of it was difficult also because I guess I should just mention because of the topic of your title uh, of your talk today, uh, him using uh, references of Casa del Fascio or, or things like that. I don't know. This may be anecdotal, but uh, this I'm I'm just trying to figure out how I like that there is something more to what you're saying, but I'm trying to figure out maybe you could point me to how that might be different uh, from that time. Maybe in, maybe in terms of real, uh, I don't know, ism or in terms of presence and absence, I don't know, some kind of pointer that I could think of. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, this, um, this role that, that code plays in the articulation of an inside and an outside. No? So if you, if you think of it in terms of, of um, literacy, for example, if you are, so if you have learned to read and write, you participate in a public. Mm -hmm. But compared to those who have not learned to read and write, it's a private domain. So an exclusive one. So code really is this kind of gate establisher. No, not gatekeeper, <laughs> but it, it, it organizes access. Mm -hmm. And this means the, the, the play is no longer between, it's not in an absolute sense an inside and an outside. But how to think of this non-absolute sense without rendering it relative, which is just an, another way of remaining absolute, no? So how to, how to think it is, um, so how to think constellations which are, which are, um, changing through time. So that's why I said in the beginning, a body of thinking is not the same now as it was for uh, uh, no, 200 years ago or 500 years ago, but it's always a body of thinking. So it's in its kind, it's, it's similar, it's same, but it, it's, its interiority is articulated differently because it needs to accommodate, it needs to accommodate the, the abstractions which are at work in, the science of a certain age. 
And the abstractions are always in my in my reading, they're always the mathematics. Okay. So because mathematics is is, uh, is is the language in which through the different disciplines and the different cultures. You can kind of speak with each other because you know you point to the same thing, but neither do you own the meaning of this, nor does another language. So it's an interiority, if you want a multiplication of interiorities without organizing them into, into uh, without subjecting those interiorities to an order, which would already be there. That's the interest with the, the new materialist or with this plant mode. So the order is, is engendered by the interiorities which are being engendered. So there is this uh, reciprocity, this mutual relation of being contained and containing. Hmm. And this in my, from how I am familiar with, with, uh, with Eisenman, that would not be one of his interests. No, he's very much with an autonomy of architecture, which uh, has a very powerful and a very, uh, yeah, a, domin a dominating role, not an accommodating role. It's a dominating role. Yeah, it is a performative also projective uh, role. It, it, would you then say, so I'm kind of obsessed then with the uh, function oblique uh, from Claude Perron and, and the encounter of, so, because what you just said about without there being a pre-existing order to be subjugated by. And, and I think that the reading also then does that. My question, let's say, has more to do with what do you do with what's left? The residue, how does code or mathematics uh, uh, avoid uh, just inheriting uh, properties and packed functions? You know, code also has the, uh, from uh, uh, the function making each language PHP C++ has its uh, uh, sort of terminology of this will do so and so many so many things. Uh, how, what do you do with what is left behind or in a uh, Jean Luc Nancy sense the the vestige uh, of art? What, what do you do with what we're left with? Anything that we are surrounded with? If we are to not fall into the uh, Kipnis uh, divisions of uh, land, ground, ob object, and sort of inherited classifications. Uh, and the function oblique, I think, somehow still lingers for me. W would you then say that there is a way for, for mathematics or, or code to work with something like that, that, that loses what its original... Uh, that specially steps away from an origin of its, of its own first when it is encountered. Yes. Um, so the, re the ideas of a residue or a leftover, they presuppose a notion of spatial order, no? So if we think in terms, if we think more, so I, my, my term for this is always meteora, so the weather or the climatic. You never really have residues. No. So you have patterns of constellations which keep returning. But they don't, so this code, the code is always, that's why it's a mathematical model, does not represent its object. It articulates it. So you can have many different mathematical models of the same thing. They will give different articulations of that same thing. It's not that one of them is false. I mean, there are false ones wow. too, of course, but there can be, there can be coexisting ones, but they, they change in scales of complexity, of resolution, of complexity, of, of uh, all sorts of things, but they don't contradict each other. So mathematical models, if you don't subject them to a logical domain, of, 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 uh, of, of propositions, they can coexist. And then they can do a certain thing. It's almost like, it, they, they almost become more like musical scales or musical notations, which can be played and which, which can, which can uh, yeah, present a certain experience, but without having 
an, 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 or, an original that is being exhaustively captured by it or conserved. So the, 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 the preoccupation with traces or that which is left behind and so on from this Meteora point of view is not really anymore that big of a problem because it's all, always already thinking in cycles, in, in, in a cyclic kind of, of a reality, let's say. Okay. But with the obliques, I mean, perhaps it would be, I mean, there is, is uh, in this in these passages from his Leibniz book, he's uh, very clear. So what he says, for example, is that with the Copernican uh, uh, turn, I mean, the main, the main um, emphasis of that is that it creates a points of view of a subject within you know, the horizon. But the logic is that these points of view, so they, they, they need to fill the whole scope. So everything becomes subjective relative to a point of view. But then there are many different points of views. Mm -hmm. But in its scheme, it's the introduction of a point of view and the, um, that kind of totalizes and, and the way Serre describes it, he, he actually calls it oblique, oblique planes. I mean, he, his, his notion of system is not a logical one, it's an architectonic one. So the whole book is organized around scenography and, um, and ethnography and orthography. So it's the, or, it's the, it's the architectonic uh, notion of, of a system that is not mediated through um, through logic, through propositions and and, uh, and judgments, but through constellations. And like that, it's not a system which 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 adds up. If you want, it does the impossible. <laughs> no, so every every structure counters gravity, but it doesn't need kind of gravity. No, so but it's it's an articulation in that sense. All simultaneously of the. That's a vantage points. Yeah. So with code, it's never about exhaustively representing something. It's about um, reference, so making, so yeah, identifying a constellation of index points, which will more or less facilitate a repetition of a certain experience, let's say. Mm -hmm. Which is quite close, by the way, to how scale was thought in architecture before. I would say the the dominance of uh, of computer drawing when, when scale got conflated with the uh, zooming, let's say, the scaling. But um, we have a question in the chat from uh, Chris Julien. Or do you want to read it yourself, or shall I read it? Yeah, I think I, I think I can read it. I just wanted to uh, structure it uh, well. So, very thanks for the talk. I'm really interested by uh, this simultaneity that you were describing in this technique of inversion being both a negation and an affirmation. I'm very fascinated by this certain uh, yeah quality that that certain techniques can have. And then you were talking in your answer just now about this uh, engendering of orders by interiorities as this sort of new materialist phenomenology almost. Um, so I'm wondering if you can tie these two together. So this technique of, of inversion, if you can explore that a little more through this notion of interiorities. And then maybe also as a bonus, if I can put it that way, maybe you would object outside of, of, of the, the sphere of mathematics. And then, for example, in relation to the fascist question or fascist phenomena. Yeah. Um, yes, I, that's true. I didn't pick this up. Let's start with the last part, perhaps even. Um, so when with, with Gattari, now in principle, the, 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 the idea of, of uh, considering, like I said in the beginning, I am not at, at all sure whether it's a good idea, no, but I, 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 it's still not answered to me, I don't know. But the, the point, so what, what Gattari does, and I think this is, a, a, this is a right move to in a way demoralize the question to a certain extent, by naturalizing it, but he relates it to the will. And the will, um, the will is much less a, a material, a material reality than, than an affect. So <clears throat> to speak then of, of, an, uh, of an affect would to a certain extent also, 
So these interiorities, uh, you know, we can't. I think the allergy that uh, Deleuze, Deleuze has against uh, pleasure, for example, and Qatari, is that such an interiorization, of course, emphasizes on a certain homogeneity. So it's a self, no? So it, it's the claiming of a space for the self to a certain extent. And what I'm trying to, to, to find is, is, a, is a way how such an, a space for a self um, can be thought in a public way. So that would be the interiorization. No? And if there are many interiorizations like that, um, the way of, let's say, to stay with the metaphor of public talks would have to change <laughs> because to cultivate, and that's also, I think, uh, the, the line that Foucault is, is, uh, is, is, really, is really pushing. So to, to say a culture of the self, it kind of um, makes reservations, let's say, or keeps a self withheld to a certain extent from a transparency of an, of an adequate uh, recognition. So it's not so much about being recognized as who one is on the level of ontology or on the level of, of, uh, of, 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 of critical theory, but it becomes uh, much more a kind of a self which, 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 uh, which, which, which appears in public, which has in a way is a person in public and knows how to do that <laughs> without being all there. No? So it's a, it's a kind of a tempering, it's a kind of a, I mean, Sloterdijk uses, uses these terms of a, an immune system, not to build out an immune system. He says, so he has a very drastic image, which I think resonates with also this image of a kind of a precariousness of, of, of bodies. So Sloterdijk speaks of us being, um, so the notion of the subject now is, is almost like a baby who, who was born too early and, and needs this, this, um, this prosthesis to have a, an artificial climate to grow to grow stronger in order to to become able to live and and uh, this kind of interiority perhaps would be i mean it's a functional picture it's a cybernetic functional picture <laughs> in Sloterdijk, which i'm not very fond of but it's a, it's about um yeah maybe introducing the, the a relation between prosthesis and body in a way that doesn't kind of think of the prosthesis as a as a functional um, as a functional uh, a correction or an optimization or an or an augmentation even or a, or a correct yeah a correction of a lack, but in its in its um, almost metaphysical sense. So to to put something so to prosthesis so to 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 state something ahead of you, no, which you are not yet. <laughs> no, as as a kind of a, yeah, no, an orientation for a, for for this uh, for an interior for an interiorization. Somehow in in this in this relation, and then there, there wouldn't be there is not an order of interiorities, but the interiorities they always need to to trans. So there is really a primacy of translations, and the translations they don't. They don't convey an original into a secondary. They establish the place where um, there can be talk between different languages. <laughs> yeah, and this uh, so this uh, this kind of prosthetic uh, prosthetics, let's say that you were talking about. No, so it's uh, it's. Um, it's also present in this book by Kalas on the Hunter. And uh, I think there it's interesting that the, the articulation of container, con container and contained turns precisely through the prosthetics, let's say, of the hunter in uh, not only, let's say, prey and predator, but also in the idea of uh, possession and mimesis. So possession, which is still with, uh, with desire and pleasure, let's say, 
because there's also kind of this, this actually of possession and then the inverse to it would be mimesis so to let oneself be possessed by something but also to appropriate in a way by uh, in turn so it's all uh, it's articulated in this other manner yeah Yeah, I mean, that would be another discourse to address this interior, interiority as well, no? to say that in mimesis, it's not about the other. So if you, if you, if you say, so you, you, it's like when we, lear we learn, I, I don't believe there can be learning without mimesis. No? <laughs> so we see how people do it and we learn from that. But that doesn't mean that we want to, to, to step into the place that these people are necessary. No? So if there is a transcendent at the circles, this the, the objective transcendental. So if you if you if you keep your if you keep an eye or a focus on on a, on on what um, this person from whom you learn what they were concerned with, not so much were they right? Can I make it stronger? But but uh, what were they thinking? So you it's in, this is this impersonal mode of of uh, of of, of being, being mimetical. That it doesn't that doesn't involve this kind of subjugation and then conquest, but it's a kind of a service public even almost no one. I mean, in my ideas with this digital continent, it's it's a, it's a kind of a, a service public actually, mm -hmm. but one which does not administrate a scarcity, a scarcity of resources, a scarcity of territory, a scarcity of privileges, a scarcity any any kind of scarcity. So that's again with the copia, with the, with the transcriptions of the code, there is an abundance. And the point is not that there is too little, there is actually way too much of things. <laughs> yeah, amen to that. Thanks for that answer and, and addition also regarding. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is there any other questions? Otherwise, I think we had quite a nice debate and conclusion. And thanks again, Vera, for the lecture. Um, before closing, perhaps, uh, I don't know if you have any concluding remarks. Um, otherwise, I will uh, remind everybody that the last, uh, the, 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 this, this, the series of lecture, the program will conclude next Friday uh, for Philippe Morel's lecture, Matter as Machine at 6.30. And I look forward to seeing you there. And thanks again, Vera. And thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, Ricardo. And thanks to everybody. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.